Okay, we are now recording. Um, good morning, I'm Jill Erickson. I'm Head of Reference and Adult Services at the Falmouth Public Library. I'm sitting in for Sue Henkin this week because she actually has the morning off. Um, and this is the third week of a four-week class and is part of our ever popular Joy of Learning series. Um, this course uses recent research uncovering unknown histories of Portuguese and Cape Verdean immigration to Falmouth and Cape Cod and I am delighted to actually get to hear some of this in real time. Um, Miguel Maniz will be, is here with us and Lou White, and they are going to take over the screen. It's over to you, Miguel. Great, thanks. Hi everybody, uh, Miguel Maniz here um, from uh, outside of Lisbon, Portugal uh, with Lou White and um, we're going to talk today about um, picking up on some of the themes that we, we touched on last week. I uh, just want to say thanks to Falmouth Public Library again for the invitation to, uh, to do this class. Um, you said that recent research, um, that, that the class is based on some recent research, and it's really recent today because some of the stuff I, I found out actually in the last 24 hours that I'll be presenting today uh, after doing a deep dive into the Falmouth Enterprise Archive. Um, and, um, and I'm really excited to talk, about, uh, talk to you all about, um, uh, about, about today's theme, which really looks at and tries to dispel some of the myths about Portuguese political participation and, um, and, and really uh, the nature of the town's history uh, prior to World War II. So um, the Portuguese are often called the invisible minority. And what this means by the invisible Esteli Smith, uh, anthropologist, um, Esteli Smith came up with this uh, many years ago. I don't, I, I've never agreed with this, uh, mainly because I think if you look at what actually happened versus how people talk about things, a lot of times history is not used to actually understand the past, but is often used to make an argument about the present. And um, uh, I, I, just, I, I think that this obviously happens, but um, our goal is really to try and use history to understand the past. And uh, if we do that, uh, we see that the Portuguese actually were not really at all invisible, um, nor were they very silent, uh, and, uh, and actually were quite politically active, quite engaged in uh, a number of uh, activities to try and improve their, their situation and their position. And we're going to talk about some of those today. Uh, as usual, I would like to give you, um, there's also a myth in town that somehow it was after World War II that, um, that, that caused the Portuguese to become politically active or that caused them to get engaged in town uh, affairs and civic affairs and these kinds of things. This is all nonsense um, as we'll, we'll find out today. Uh, the Portuguese actually were quite involved in town affairs and civic politics uh, from quite an early, early stage, really from the, the, the teens on. Um, even before that too, if you include some letter writing campaigns to the Falmouth Enterprise. Um, but in terms of actual uh, voting, political participation, and these kinds of things, the Portuguese really get involved from, from the teens on. And again, when I say the Portuguese, I'm talking about Portuguese during this time period for many geographies, uh, including the Azores, including Cabo Verde, which of course becomes an independent nation in the 70s, but at this time is um, uh, uh, people from Cabo Verde are Portuguese, uh, Portuguese citizens. Um, so uh, I'm talking about national identities, not uh, ethnic identities or any other kind of identities like that when I refer to people during this time period as, as Portuguese. So, um, and it's also, by the way, how most of the people from all of those geographies also refer to themselves, an important distinction uh, to make as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here uh, with you. Uh, let's see, I need to get to a different view. Share screen. Uh, ah, well, it would help, help if I opened my PDF here. So this is what I'll share with you all. Where is it? Uh, try it again. Share screen. And there it is. So uh, I usually have a nice image. Um, uh, uh, that I like to give you a kind of an emblematic image of, of the days uh, of the day's talk. But um, I don't really have one because a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about took place in, in, in many ways in, in underground ways that um, uh, my main archive today is the Falmouth Enterprise. Although I am also drawing from uh, a number of other sources including uh, the Portuguese uh, language press 
um, that that uh, was in, in New England, uh, mainly from the Claire Carney and Fajera Menge archives at UMass Dartmouth's digital archive, which has an incredible searchable archive if you read Portuguese. Uh, if you don't, uh, there's a number of really good translating uh, translators on the market these days. So um, what I'm mostly talking about today are political, economic, civic McWill, I'm sorry, can I just pause for you in just for a moment because someone just asked, can you put your computer on full screen mode because it's easier to read? Oh, well, um, the problem with my doing that is I um, is, is that I, I, I run out of, um, uh, I, I can't see my notes if I do that. Oh. So um, okay, I, uh, then I'm going to ask- We'll have to make do. Yeah, I mean, how is it very small? Is the is the image very very small? If somebody could could tell me, um, let, let me see what happens if I go to full screen uh, full, full screen mode here. Oh, some, it's, somebody says text is harder to read when it's not full screen, but it looks like right now you do have it full screen. It does on mine, um, but. That, that's good. You're now, it, it has, it looks like it has now taken off all your, we can't see everything that was over on the left. So we're, it looks like we are seeing your full screen right now. Except you just moved it and now we're getting, seeing some of the slides on this side, but, um, but by all means, carry on. <laughs> and it's, a, and you're muted right now, uh, Miguel. So. Okay. There you go. No I'm, no, I'm not. Excellent. Carry on. All right. So um, these are some of, I'm going to talk about today some, some Portuguese associations, what we call associations. There's a long history of these organizations in Portugal. Um, um, we, we, um, uh, they're, they're essentially civic organizations, community fraternal civic organizations. And this list, uh, I, I went through the Massachusetts and Rhode Island archives a couple of years ago and tried to collect um, much harder to do in Massachusetts, given the way that the information stored, but I did it for every single one of them in Rhode Island. And I created a, a basic uh, database of all of the, uh, these associations uh, that exist. Um, these are some other ones that, that we can see here, uh, types of associations from 1870 to 1960s, history associations, volunteer fire departments, veterans associations, agricultural cooperatives, financial organizations, unions. Um, going back here, we can see mutual aid societies, uh, educational organizations. Um, we've got Lou White here who uh, wrote a book actually on uh, one of Falmouth's um, social, um, re socio-religious organizations, the Holy Ghost Feast, which are very prominent as well. So um, these associations um, were everywhere um, and uh, helped, the, helped the Portuguese to create a sense of community life, uh, but also uh, allowed them to participate in political life, economic life, uh, social life, religious life as well. I'm gonna get back to these in a second, but I wanna dip back quickly to uh, some of the things that we were talking about last week. So last week, we talked a little bit about these, the ideas of the, uh, the ethnologists um, and, and, and what, race, what racism really is. So the ethnologists had a very particular view of racism, their, their understanding of racism. And first of all, all racism is an ideology of difference. It's the idea that, that there's some arbitrary characteristics that we're going to use define people by those arbitrary characteristics as if those arbitrary characteristics are immutable and say that those arbitrary characteristics then equate to, to um, uh, other kinds of uh, qualities, uh, qualities that are always seen as inferior to another group's arbitrary characteristics. Um, and we can use, you know, um, historically, the way that race has been used has been with uh, definitions of skin color. But what we really find is that's actually not really true uh, that it's not really about skin color so much as it is how uh, groups of people are categorized um, into groups that are inferior or 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 not uh, based on other uh, based on other arbitrary characteristics. Um, the ethnologists had a very particular way of seeing race operating, however, and when the large group of immigrants in the Second Industrial Revolution, and this is the whole group of people that we talked about last week, it came from the 1870s really on, um, including the Portuguese. 
uh, start to come in and, you know, in a place like Falmouth, this results in 40% of the population over the period of about 15, 20 years um, uh, being um, uh, uh, growing. And that growth is 40% is, is, is of the population because it's Portuguese, a uh, 40% increase in the population rather, um, uh, uh, you know, over this, over this time period. So um, one thing that happens, and we also talked a little bit quickly last week, is that some of the political activism that takes place among, the among all of these groups um, is the unions that, that start to represent these workers, these immigrant workers, are often socialist and communist organizations. Uh, and this leads, again, to some, uh, to some problems because uh, these groups are being called un-American because they're participating in communist and socialist organizations that are helping them, but those are the only groups that are helping them. So um, there's this feedback that takes place where the immigrant groups are seen doubly as un-American as a result of, of, of their advocacy for their own, uh, their own rights uh, in the mills and in other places. Um, there is a group of progressives that comes along in the 1910s and they try to counteract this notion of the ethnologists, which say that the immigrants should not be here, um, not because they're, uh, um, the, the ethnologists are saying that these people are unequipped for citizenship. The ethnologist position is that they're unequipped for citizenship because they are racially or genetic, biogenetically predisposed to being inferior people. Therefore, they can't do things like vote or they shouldn't be able to vote. Um, the progressive Americanization movement um, presents a counter to that argument. And their goal was actually to try and end the notion of biogenetic um, uh, superiority, inferiority. And what they propose is that the problem with immigrants, and again, the problem with immigrants, this was what they called it. The, the immigrant problem was the way that people referred to it at the time. If you remember from our discussion last week about the Dillingham Commission reports, but the, um, the immigrant problem, as it's called by, uh, by these, these individuals, would be solved not um, by saying that they were <clears throat> genetically uh, inferior because of their racial differences, but rather the problem was one of a lack of education. And that if the immigrants could be educated, if they could be taught English, if they could be given civics classes on uh, the history of American institutions um, and civic participation and the like, uh, then uh, they would they would uh, be able to assimilate. This is this was the rhetoric of uh, the Americanization movement. When we talk about assimilation, uh, people think of assimilation, of course, as something that's inevitable. Immigrants come, they spend a couple of generations in a new place, and then they assimilate and become like like um, you know more like the mainstream. Um, the problem with this way of seeing things, and this is a way of seeing things that is uh, you know talked about even today. Um, most anthropologists and I would include myself among those, um, re reject this notion as a model of, of what is actually happening. What's really happening is that there are certain markers of identity that immigrants need to adhere to or toe the line to in order for them to be able to be, able to be allowed to participate in civic life. And assimilation is not an inevitable occurrence. It's actually a political requirement of immigrants that they adhere to if they want to, um, you know, if they want to, to, to participate in, in social life. So the Americanization thinkers on the one hand were, were trying to create a progressive project that would end, you know, some of these racial disparities. At the same time, they were also presenting a different set of barriers to the immigrant where the immigrant had to act like what was considered an American by, you know, the white nationalist political power structure that existed at the time. Um, and if they didn't act like that, then they wouldn't be able to participate politically. Um, what's interesting is the way that certain immigrant groups trying to escape racism accepted this premise and participated with the, with, in the move, actively participated in the movement to Americanize the immigrant. What often took place was that certain immigrants were able to become white while others were not. And this was certainly the case um, with a lot of arguments uh, within the Portuguese community, given the great geographic disparity. Um, this gets written today oftentimes as Cape Verdeans being non-white and other kinds of Portuguese being white, but that wasn't the case at the time. And in fact, um, there are arguments within Cape Verdean communities that, um, that in which some Cape Verdeans are making an argument that they're white and other Cape Verdeans are not. It takes place within Azorean groups 
in which some Azorians are saying they're white and some Azorians are saying they're not. It takes place with people from continental Portugal saying they're white and the, the ones from the islands are not. Um, and there's no scientific definition of these racial characteristics. Um, these are political definitions. Whiteness is a political definition. And um, the Americanization movement is something that actually um, is, 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 is used by immigrant groups to make arguments over their racial identity in the US. So this is kind of the, the broader political uh, background and something to keep in mind. What was the Americanization movement? So mainly the Americanization movement was, was federal and state money designed to give education. Um, and um, you know, where they would pay certain amounts of money to local school, school boards to teach uh, English classes, to teach civics classes, um, the Americanization, the National American Civic League was a Boston organization. And in fact, New England becomes one of the largest experimental zones for the Americanization movement in the entire country. Um, and uh, Boston is, is one of the places that's really the leader of this. Chicago is another place. If you've ever read uh, Jane Addams uh, and uh, you know, 20 Years at Hull House, uh, these were all experiments in the Americanization movement. In fact, the NAACP, is um, in, in many ways also a, uh, an experiment in Americanization. This notion that uh, the problems of racism can be solved by, uh, by education and by helping, what ends up becoming a smaller elite group of people to escape uh, poverty, to escape the problems of, uh, of working class immigrants. And, and this one of the themes today is actually going to be about how the difference between how elites are able to navigate some of these, um, some of the discrimination in a way that a lot of people who are not elite are not able to navigate that discrimination. Um, Lou actually has examples of a number of elites uh, in town that um, uh, that were that were able to, um, you know, to become politically and civically active. Um, uh, but it, it's also not a one-to-one -one relationship. Like some escaped and some didn't. A lot of these elites actually did so. Be, worked within. Um, within this power structure to actually help broader, uh, broader numbers of immigrants to, to gain political and civic access as well, or economic access as well. So um, it's not really just an antagonistic relationship. It's a very complicated uh, and fuzzy relationship with different groups of people fighting for rights. Um, and this also includes a number of non-immigrant uh, uh, immigrant elites in the US who are also trying to help the immigrants to, to gain civic participation and civic access as well. Um, so the Portuguese associations are actively involved in, the Amer in, in many of the Americanization goals. Uh, and this takes place throughout the region, but it also takes place specifically in Falmouth. So as early as, the as 1915, one of the strawberry growers uh, organizations has a meeting where they specifically are calling for naturalization and they, and they want Portuguese people to learn how to become um, you know, to, 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 uh, to become naturalized citizens and become uh, US citizens so that they can end up voting. Um, in a place like Falmouth, this was very interesting because until this point, Falmouth has an open town meeting. Uh, there's no representative democracy. At this point, it's a pure, uh, pure democracy in its purest form in which one person, one vote, you go to show up at the town meeting, you vote on the issues. Well, one can imagine what the effect this might've had on local elites uh, given the influx of all of these Portuguese into town. Um, the Portuguese saw that, that being able to vote would be a quick way, an easy way for them to um, uh, you know, gain some political power in the town and, and be able to pass laws that benefited uh, their situation. Um, Jill uh, Erickson uh, was, uh, from the library was just talking to me before and she mentioned in fact that some of these divisions between different parts of town, West Falmouth and East Falmouth, North Falmouth and, uh, and East Falmouth, you know, East Falmouth was sort of looked down upon, uh, Wakoit especially, but, uh, and Wakoit during this time period also encompasses a much larger part of East Falmouth than it does today. Wakoit's been sort of pushed over to the very, very, very um, uh, Eastern part of town, but at the time it was, uh, it encompassed a, you know, where today the Fresh Pond Carrot Shop Road is, where Fresh Pond is, um, this was all part of Wakoit. But anyway, um, there, there were a lot of disparities and some of these are still, I think, I still think they play out today. Um, uh, in interesting and in interesting ways, um, but um, but nonetheless, um, uh, some of some of these uh, um, the efforts in the part of people in the quote unquote eastern part of town 
were to, to try and have political participation with some of these other villages in Falmouth and ways that they, that they uh, had been excluded from, given that it was almost all immigrants. So what were the organizations in town? Uh, so this is, these are, you know, when people say that the Portuguese weren't actively involved in civics or politics or any of these things, it's, um, it's just, it just makes me laugh because this is just Falmouth. So these are some of the organizations in town prior to World War II um, that had uh, some uh, political, uh, some um, uh, political participation and economic participation. Now, some of these were beneficial societies. So if we look at the Holy Ghost Society of Santuit, Kutuit, this is founded in 1891. And yes, I know this is not Falmouth, but there are a number of people from Falmouth that participated in this organization. Um, so I include them. Uh, the ones that were actually in Falmouth are all the rest. This includes the Wakoit uh, Holy Ghost Society, which then becomes the Fresh Pond Holy Ghost Society, uh, which is active before 1900, um, builds a, a very important social hall in 1905. Um, where a number of meetings are held, political meetings and economic cooperative meetings are held. Um, there's another uh, hall that's built um, by an organization in 1886. It's called the East Falmouth Hall. It's part of the East Falmouth Village Association. Um, there's a bunch of East Falmouth Halls though, and this is, this is where uh, doing history gets actually quite confusing because there's three different or four actually, three, three different um, uh, East Falmouth Halls. There's the Fresh Pond Holy Ghost Society in 1905. There's the East Falmouth Village Association, um, which is, um, um, I'm not sure when it's built, but from 1886 on that association. And that is actually not really a Portuguese association, but this hall ends up being taken over by the Portuguese as this um, organization goes defunct um, you know, in the late 1800s. Um, and almost, and, and if you look in the enterprise, many, many events take place in this hall um, uh, and they're almost all Portuguese events although there are other social events taking place there as well. And then there's, the, there's also the Brick Kiln St. Anthony's Hall, which, is, which also often gets confused with St. Anthony's Church. It is not, um, it's a separate organization. Um, it then morphs into the present day St. Anthony's Club. But this again is another um, uh, community hall, Portuguese uh, community hall that gets used for meetings. Brick Kiln Road is one of the most important roads in town during this time period, um, I'm kind of, uh, getting away from my, 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 um, uh, our discussion about uh, associations, and there's a lot to get to today, so I want to move on. But, uh, um, uh, but, but Brick Kiln Road is, is a really important road in town. This hall becomes an extremely important place as well, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Cape Cod Strawberry Growers Association, um, I have talked about this in another number of lectures. There's a lot of information about this. I'm not going to spend too much time with this. But um, there's a couple of different organizations that get founded, the Cape Cod Strawberries Growers Association, the Falmouth Strawberry Growers Association. People think there's only one, there's actually three. Um, in fact, the Cape Cod Strawberry Growers Association, uh, um, uh, tr tr a bit of, um, uh, what do they say, uh, um, uh, to, to be honest about, um, about my own biases and all of this, um, my father's uh, grandfather is, one of, the, is the found, one of the founders of the Cape Cod Strawberry Growers Association. Um, there's a big fight within about a few weeks of the organization being founded. And uh, he was the treasurer, uh, Jose Muniz. He ends up throwing out um, the whole rest of the board um, who then go on to found in the following year, the Falmouth Strawberry Growers Association. And these are two competing organizations uh, that, that, um, you know, that are founded. Uh, you also have coming along a little bit later, the Falmouth Farmers Cooperative Association, which doesn't get founded until 1930. Um, an organization that nobody knows about in Falmouth, including the Portuguese, um, is the Portuguese Fraternity. Um, this is something that emerged in some research of mine for other projects uh, in New England. Um, the Portuguese Fraternity is actually an organization. Uh, it's a beneficial or a mutual beneficial or insurance scheme. Remember, prior to all of the reforms that take place um, by um, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, if you're an immigrant you, and you get hurt, or sick on the job, there is no unemployment insurance for you. There's no health insurance. Um, you know, you're out of luck. You're gonna you're gonna die, or you're gonna go poor, and your family's gonna starve. So, um, some of these organizations, for example, the Holy Ghost organizations, actually gave uh, assistance to people who were they were unemployed, or if they got sick, or to help them bury their family members um, in the case of death. The Portuguese fraternity is one of the largest Massachusetts and New England, and then eventually in the country, um, beneficial schemes uh, that exists. 
Um, I'm going to talk about them in a, in a bit, in a bit, but that's basically an insurance scheme. Then you have, um, and the Portuguese fraternity also starts to do a lot of political active, uh, activities. Portuguese American Civic League is another Falmouth organization that, that becomes quite active in the 1930s. Um, uh, Lou's going to talk a little bit about them and some of the members of the uh, Portuguese American Civic League. The Cape Verdean, what we know today as the Cape Verdean Club of Falmouth, was actually originally the Cape Verdean Citizens Political Club. It's actually founded as a political organization holding candidates nights, something that continues uh, to be done by the Cape Verdean Club of Falmouth decades after its founding. Um, uh, some, very, some of the, the, the town's most important uh, candidates political forums were held at these organizations, uh, as well as at the Portuguese fraternity, which also does the same thing. And then I just threw in uh, just to, to let you know that the two that people know about are really the one that people know about today. The Portuguese American Club was founded in 1983. It's quite a recent organization. The Cape Verdean Club, people also know. Um, this one was one that was founded in the 1930s, but it's still quite active today. Um, and then there was also another Holy Ghost Society that was founded in, um, in um, 1984. If you wanna know about those Holy Ghost Societies, talk to Lou White um, uh, sometime. He wrote the book of, on the, of, uh, of one of the, the organizations here called Sopish. Um, and, um, and he really knows more than anybody else uh, about that. I did a, a project on Holy Ghost Feast. I know a lot about Holy Ghost Feast in the, in the, large, uh, the large picture. Uh, so you can talk to me about those as well. Um, this is a picture of the uh, Fresh Pond Holy Ghost Society, a place where a lot of these organizations held their meetings. Um, this is a socio-religious organization um, of lay persons, although the church was sometimes involved. Um, these organizations really were though run by lay people. Um, it's really important to note also that throughout New England, before there's a church, you know, one of the narratives of Falmouth is that the, hot, the, the important role of St. Anthony's Church, the church that Strawberry's built, everybody wants to talk about this. And yes, it's absolutely true. St. Anthony's Church was a very important um, uh, and key uh, social organization in town, but it wasn't the only one. And actually, there were many other organizations before St. Anthony's Church gets founded. Um, and then, and on top of that, St. Anthony's Church is founded by the people who founded these Holy Ghost Societies. So the Holy Ghost Societies in most places in New England actually takes actually gets founded before there's a church. And they're the ones that raise a lot of the money. And in fact, it's really a misnomer to say that it's the church that Strawberry's built. In fact, it's really a church in many ways that the Holy Ghost Society's built. Um, and uh, many of these Holy Ghost Societies also, the key members of the Holy Ghost Societies were also the people that, that were working in Strawberry's. Like strawberry farming was not something that people did throughout the year. It was a short time of the year that this was active. Um, it did bring in a lot of money uh, and had an outsized role, almost romantic role. But there were lots of other things that the Portuguese were doing in town for work and for business besides working in strawberries. Those people that were responsible for a lot of this work were the people that were also running and participating in all of these, um, uh, these socio-religious organizations like the Fresh Pond Holy Ghost Society, the Kituit and Santuit Holy Ghost Society. And I'm still trying to research this, but I believe there may, be, there may have been another Holy Ghost Society that went um, extinct once the church becomes, um, uh, comes into, uh, comes into uh, to being. Um, but I, I, can't, um, I, I can't yet definitively say that that's true. Uh, we've talked a lot about the economic and farmers uh, cooperatives or cartels. Um, this is another uh, important way that the Portuguese took political and economic control. Um, it's really important to mention in this that these organizations depended, although they were Portuguese organizations, they really were collaborative organizations that depended upon um, uh, contributions of, of the Portuguese community uh, in Falmouth, but also all of Falmouth residents, regional business interests, and especially um, scientists and state and county agricultural agents. And in this, I would mention two important people, businessman Wilfred Wheeler and Barnstable County agricultural agent, Bert Tomlinson, who did extraordinary work to try and actually get the Portuguese to form these cooperatives, um, even though the, the Portuguese were the ones that formed them themselves, um, you know, and then also would avail, the, avail um, you know, try, try and bring in, uh, information, the, 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 the current state of the art of scientific information to tell the Portuguese and help the Portuguese um, um, to, to learn about, you know, what were some of the growing techniques, best growing techniques, what were um, uh, some of the newest fertilizers, the newest uh, hybrids, these kinds of things. And then, you know, worked with the Portuguese, the Portuguese themselves had opportunities to be innovative um, and, um, and, and learn from these activities. Um, Bert Tomlinson especially was a guy that was very sensitive to how immigrants learned 
Um, he was very sensitive to the fact that many of the Portuguese didn't speak English and was trying to get some of this information in booklets uh, given to them in Portuguese, in fact. Um, so a very interesting uh, character, Bert Tomlinson. Um, he doesn't really get, in fact, most of the, um, uh, all the stories that get told about Falmouth in, for example, in the book of Falmouth and all these things, no one really ever credits Bert Tomlinson, but the stories that they're telling are actually not their stories, but rehashing Bert Tomlinson's narrative about the Portuguese in Falmouth. So, you know, there's a, Bert Tomlinson writes a couple of letters where he characterizes all of this, and then these become sort of the narratives of all the Portuguese town. Um, and they get written in a way that maybe is a little bit different, I think, than, than Bert Tomlinson saw the situation. Um, but Bert Tomlinson's a great guy. I, I would love to, um, I, I, he's, he forms a, a large part of my own research on the history of Falmouth. Um, and he's someone that, that everyone should, should take a deeper look at. Um, another thing that's important to note is that there's a very monolithic view of the Portuguese. Um, and the Portuguese are actually a very complex group that we've been kind of trying to talk about some of these ways. Even within the Portuguese community, there's geographic differences, there's differences in different parts of town. Um, <clears throat> but even these organizations had competition and fought with one, with one another. Um, the Falmouth Farmers Cooperative Association actually I think is founded because I think some of the Portuguese um, were not willing to join uh, with groups of other Portuguese. I don't know if this was about race. I don't know if it was about geographic differences, uh, differences between Cape Verdeans and Azorians, differences between um, uh, different kinds of groups. I do know that the Falmouth Farmers Cooperative Association and the Falmouth Strawberries Growers Association had Cape Verdeans in them. I don't know if the Cape Cod Strawberry Growers Association did. Um, this is something that I've been slowly trying to uncover in research is the, uh, the inter-Portuguese battles that were taking place and why they were taking place is also very important. One of the reasons that I believe that they were taking place um, was, again, part of it had to do with the Americanization movement, white nationalism, and the way that white nationalism becomes a way for Portuguese to, um, in other words, for Portuguese to, uh, by being racist against other Portuguese, some Portuguese were able to escape racism. So the Portuguese go through a transformation where they become white, effectively. Um, you know, if we looked at last week, we had all the descriptions of the Portuguese as non-white by, um, by all those sociologists, by the Dillingham Commission reports, by some of the, um, uh, the people doing genetic writing and sociological writing about the Portuguese. Um, the, the, the Portuguese have, many of the Portuguese have, a, they fight against this by, by trying to become white. Um, one way that they did this was through the Americanization movement. We'll talk about that in a second. So these beneficial societies and political organizations um, that, um, that get founded, Portuguese fraternity has one of the biggest, it's an insurance scheme that has one of the biggest benefits. John Kerry's grandfather is an economist who writes a book about um, uh, these insurance schemes in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts. And he calls out the Portuguese fraternity as having one of the more uh, prominent, um, uh, you know, prominent um, uh, um, benefits that are given. Uh, in fact, all of the immigrant association uh, uh, benefits, actually, he has, he, has, he has a lot of really positive things to say about, about what they're able to, to accomplish. Um, they also have a, a key role in the Americanization movement, both nationally, but also locally, as a result of this guy, Thomas Ferreira. Thomas Ferreira is a really interesting figure. He's one of the original uh, officers of the, or his family is, are the original officers in the Cape Cod Strawberry Growers Association that all get thrown off. And then they found the Falmouth uh, Strawberry Growers Cooperative. He becomes president. Um, he also becomes a longstanding president of the Portuguese fraternity. He takes an active role in getting Portuguese uh, involved in politics, getting them involved in civic life. Um, uh, and some of the things that they do are completely in line with the Americanization scheme. So during World War I, he starts a bond drive to raise money for World War I. Um, you know, this was one way that immigrants were able to prove that they were patriotic in the middle of World War I. There's a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment that's taking place. Um, and immigrant groups did things like they, they sponsored bond drives to raise money. And it was a kind of a, a patriotic civic activism. By acting patriotic, by participating in Fourth of July parades, um, most of these organizations organized the participation of Portuguese immigrants in Fourth of July parades. Um, the Lowell Daily Sun in uh, the late 1800s and actually into the 1900s always writes really proudly about the fact that certain immigrant groups are participating in the 4th of July parade. Why aren't they all participating in them? Uh, this proves that the immigrants, these are good immigrants. And this narrative of the good immigrant versus the bad immigrant also gets created as a part of this. So there's a two-pronged kind of approach here. One is 
immigrants shouldn't have to participate in Fourth of July parades in order to be considered good immigrants, right? Um, however, um, that is one way that the immigrants were able to, you know, to do this. I remember I had a student in, after 9-11, I had a student um, when I was teaching at UMass Dartmouth at the time. Uh, he was um, an Egyptian kid. He was a Muslim kid. And um, I remember, you know, he grew up in America. He, he was an American kid, you know. After 9-11, every day he would come to school wearing an American flag shirt. And, you know, he didn't have to do this. Like, why did he have to do this? But this was his way to kind of create a narrative about himself that allowed him to feel like he was part of this broader community and to escape some of the negative stereotypes against, against him. And participation in a lot of these events was one way for immigrants to do that. Um, if you notice, um, there's a huge pilgrim commemoration uh, at the, uh, in the, eight, 1920, um, uh, uh, the 1920 celebration of the pilgrims in Provincetown and a dedication of the pilgrim monument. monument. The Portuguese fraternity is huge in this. Um, they also raise money. If you look at Falmouth Town, uh, in front of the Falmouth Public Library, actually, um, there's a fantastic, uh, there's a war dead memorials. Uh, and if you look at those war dead memorials, um, you see that all the Portuguese names that are on that list. And this was an active activity of some of the Portuguese organizations to get their, their, their war dead on those war memorials, because it, it just proves if, if you know, there's, it's, it's creating the ultimate sacrifice for a country uh, by sacrificing one's own life in, in uh, you know, fighting in a war, um, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to be considered an outsider if, if someone or one from one's community um, uh, does that. So um, these memorializations were extremely important to immigrant communities and the Portuguese fraternity takes a very active role in this. Um, they also take an active role in, um, as, as well in candidates nights. And I wanna talk a little bit here, I'm almost running out of time. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. And I also, Lou has some people that he wants to talk about with you uh, as well. Uh, we've been going over just as a warning to you, Jill, by about 15 minutes, 20 minutes every day. So uh, hopefully you, you don't have a lunch break to take, uh, but-, um, uh, but um, uh, uh, You, you I, go, as, go as long as you wish. It's right, fascinating. <laughs> so um, the, Cape, the, Cape, uh, um, the Cape Verdean Citizens, Citizens Club also, starts in 1935, they start, um, I'll get to them in a second, but they have candidates nights as well. Um, these organizations were a larger conduit to the larger Portuguese community. Um, so Falmouth has this reputation with Portuguese all over New England and even back in, uh, in Portugal itself as being a place uh, with a very active and large Portuguese community. Um, at one point, Falmouth has, uh, they host the Portuguese fraternities annual convention. Uh, and there's 37 chapters of the Portuguese fraternity in 19, um, it says 1924, but that's a typo. Um, it's 1926, I believe, when they have this, uh, this event. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, they, they hold it at Terrace Gables in Falmouth. Um, and the Falmouth Enterprise actually ends up publishing a newspaper article written in Portuguese, in Portuguese, about this event. Um, and this article ends up getting picked up by the Portuguese press. If, but but interesting, you know, usually it's the other way around. An article appears in the Portuguese press, gets translated into English, and appears in you know the the, the non-Portuguese press. This is a really rare occasion where the Falmouth Enterprises publishes something first in Portuguese that then gets picked up by the Portuguese press and reprinted, obviously, in Portuguese. Um, and it's a very sweet. Uh, the, the writer has lots of nice things to say about Falmouth. There's a quote here; you can read it yourself. Um, but, um, but it's a major, major event. Thomas Ferreira was responsible for bringing this event to Falmouth. So as you can imagine, these kinds of events really create a sense of political activism for the residents of Falmouth as well. Even though he was an elite driving some of these activities, um, they end up doing a lot of other activities. So the Americanization movement um, is something that's spearheaded by Thomas Ferreira and the Portuguese fraternity. And they have a bunch of events uh, at the Falmouth. Uh, he, he's in the uh, Falmouth PTA, in fact. Because one could belong to the PTA because they had kids in the school, a lot of Portuguese, it becomes a conduit, uh, a natural conduit for political participation for the Portuguese. Some of the very first political offices that Portuguese hold are in the, um, are in the school committee. Um, uh, because again, it was also, you voted on that by your district. Well, the Portuguese had a lot of power in these Falmouth. Uh, a lot of power in uh, Davisville. They had a lot of power in these places because they had voters. Uh, so they were able to um, in, exert some influence on, uh, on, on some school committee measures. 
Um, but also the notion of the Americanization movement was something that people in Falmouth adopted as well. Um, it became something that was a way to try and, again, assimilate or help absorb. And, and you know, the Americanization movement, I'm, I'm kind of speaking at it from a perspective now that's maybe kind of negative, um, but at the time it was a progressive political movement. It was a way to try and include the immigrants um, and rather than exclude them from political life. So, um, you know, um, they, they end up having this crazy, incredible night that they repeat a couple of times where they invite all kinds of Portuguese performers um, to, uh, to a night at, um, I believe it was at the Lawrence School that was held, it actually might not be accurate. I think it was, it might've been at the junior high school, which I'm not sure where that is. Um, but um, in any case, uh, it's a night of Portuguese music with people from New Bedford. The enterprise has a huge write-up about it. They, they, they thought this was an incredible event. This brings me to another kind of really interesting and counterintuitive thing that happens with the Americanization movement. And that is that on the one hand, the Americanization movement wants to turn, uh, take away, it's a de-ethnicization movement that wants to end people acting like ethnics. At the same time, the Americanization movement is used by these ethnic groups to celebrate their own ethnic identities. And in some ways create space for them to, to, to have practices that would have been seen as disqualifying or would have marked them as different, but now become seen as, oh yeah, that's the Portuguese music. That's the Portuguese guitar. That's the Portuguese way of singing. Um, and in fact, there's also music from Cape Verde. There's a, a someone, a performer that plays on the cavaquinho, which is um, a typical Cape Verdean instrument. Um, and uh, an enterprise says he does, he's one of the best musicians of the night. Um, and so it's, it's a way to uh, demonstrate that these, activities which might be seen as marking the Portuguese as different, their Cape Verdeans as different, actually is a way for them to be seen and celebrated by people who are not Portuguese in the town. Um, in 1932, 40 people complete the 15-week the Americanization course uh, that's paid for in part by the state and in part by the Falmouth School Committee, uh, the town of Falmouth, um, which includes naturalization classes, English language classes, civics classes. There's a, there's a curriculum that's put out by the National American Civic League and um, they go to a graduation ceremony in New Bedford. The entire city of New Bedford had 80 people graduate. In Falmouth, there were 40 people that graduated. So you can see the prominence of this event uh, in, in Falmouth. So um, here's again, um, uh, whoops, this, is, this actually should say um, uh, candidates nights. So this is a bad heading here uh, in my rush. I'll just cut that off. Um, so um, the candidates nights are really, really important. And um, th there's a bunch of candidates nights that, get take, that take place. Some of these include high level people. In fact, uh, Senator Walsh ends up coming. He was a former governor of Massachusetts. Um, and he's, uh, he ends up, he's the governor for about 20 years until uh, Cabot Lodge takes over. And then eventually that's the seat that John Kennedy takes over. So Walsh is here at the Portuguese Fraternities Candidates Night, um, uh, uh, you know, talking about and you know, lobbying for votes. At another candidate's night, um, you know, there's a little bit of pandering that goes on because they're starting to see that these Portuguese form a very important voting bloc. And this is in the 30s. This is not after World War II. Uh, this is, um, you know, at a time period where the Portuguese supposedly aren't politically active at all and aren't involved in politics. Uh, well, anyway, um, you have, um, you know, different candidates coming and saying how important the Portuguese are. They want to talk about working class issues, laborers issues, and these kinds of things. Um, I'm going to dip here and share my screen, share another screen quickly uh, with you all. Oops, uh, share screen. And I'm going to share a phenomenal project that was part of the Cape Cod. Uh, can you all see this, my screen? No. Whoops, where am I here? Nope, here it is. Nope. Can you see the Cape Verdean American Citizens Political Club? Is that being shared? Yes. So um, this is a fantastic project that uh, took place as part of Migrant Communities Project um, that we did last year um, that Lou was a part of, Karen Hines was a part of, that's also here. This one was done by Corey Green uh, and Filomeno Gilbert, who's, who are both officers in the Cape Verdean Club of Falmouth and relying on the archives of uh, Carl Sonny Gonsalves, who is one of the most important, if not the most important historian of Cape Verdean culture in Falmouth today. Um, he has an archive Falmouth anyway. Um, you know, of course, the Cape, Cape Cod Cape Verde Museum and Cultural Center um, uh, has an incredible archive of incredible artifacts. And everybody should go see that, that uh, museum whenever they can. 
um, that's much broader than Falmouth, but specifically talking about Falmouth and the Cape Verdean Club, um, uh, Sonny, Sonny Gonsalves is really the, is really the guy. Um, anyway, um, I just wanted to mention that because many of these documents are from him. So um, in, uh, in 1935, is there's the first night uh, that takes place, Candidates Night, of, uh, you know, in the Cape Verdean uh, Citizens Club. They have their meetings at Fred Rose's Barbershop on Sandwich Road. Um, and, um, and really, they, they actually end up being much more active than the Portuguese fraternity in some ways in terms of politics, because uh, they have um, every, every twice a week, they have meetings uh, where they do social events, but they also are talking about candidates, how they can be politically involved. They are also participating in some of the, um, uh, some of the naturalization and Americanization movement uh, activities. Eventually, they get too large to accommodate everyone. And they petition the tea ticket school uh, to be able to, um, which is now the town administration building. And in 1940, they moved their meetings to the tea ticket school. And, um, you know, the Cape Verdean, uh, uh, the largest Cape Verdean population and Azorean population uh, is tea ticket and around Sandwich Road. So um, this was a, a natural place for, for them to have. It was right in the middle of their heart of their community, um, residential community. And, um, you know, they, they had their meetings here, bi-monthly meetings. They held candidates nights throughout the 30s. Um, these are some examples of, uh, of some of their candid uh, candidates nights that they had. Um, they switch over to the school board, but they, they ran candidates. Uh, in fact, they get very involved in the uh, election of John DeMello for school committee. Um, they sponsor his, they're, they're the sponsoring force behind it in the 1930s. Um, and, you know, this is just some information about their officers. Um, they decide around 1941-42 that they want to expand from just a political club into the general club. And this is what becomes today's Cape Verdean Club of Falmouth. Um, they started off actually as a political organization, running candidates and trying to, um, you know, to get civic activism in town. Uh, and then, you know, in 1942, they begin work on one, what's, where, where the club is today, 126 Sandwich Road. And if you notice the charters of the two organizations, um, the group that becomes the uh, charter members of the very first Cape Verdean Club of Falmouth were all of the officers of the Cape Verdean Citizens Club. So they weren't two separate organizations. It was a transformation of one organization to become the other. And uh, this is the charter of, uh, you know, that original charter of the Cape Verdean Club. Um, and, you know, with, their, with their, some of their later boards of directors, Dennis Krush is one of the founders of the, of the Citizens Club, as you can see. All right, I'm going to dip back over to my other screen and share that with you if I could. Uh, whoops, where'd everybody go? Share screen. Uh, so let's get back here. So hopefully you can all see my red screen, my maroon, my Falmouth color screen, red white. Um, these political organizations then take, a and then I'm gonna hand it off to Lou and he's got 20 minutes of overtime, five to 10 and overtime. Um, these, they take a very active role in other forms of, uh, during the depression, during pro Portuguese unemployment. The Portuguese fraternity and a number, another, a number of other organizations um, heavily petition the town uh, Miguel, to take care of unemployment. Your screen's not visible. Uh, my screen's not visible. Let's see what's going on there with that. Uh, uh, oh boy. Ah, so uh, because I didn't share it. There you go. Now it's visible. Yes? Should be sharing? Yeah. So um, the Portuguese fraternity ends up... Um, um, spearheading an effort by um, a, a, a number of Portuguese uh, who, who all come out to, to, to complain about the fact that the town is not responsive to um, uh, the, the large amount of unemployment. The Portuguese had all these political organizations because they were politically marginalized and they were also the poorest members of, uh, of, the, of the Falmouth community. Um, and as a result, they also were hardest hit by, by the depression. Um, some of the sort of intermediary elites within the Portuguese community that had interaction with town, people like John P. Silvia, who was town council, um, he was one of the highest placed Portuguese town officials for many, many years. Um, Lou's gonna talk about him in a second. Um, he is, is lobbying in this, but he actually takes kind of a conservative posture. The Portuguese actually have quite a socialist measure. They wanna take over part of the town budget and have a citizens committee that disperses the funds to the Portuguese. That would be out completely outside of the, of, of the town officials. Uh, one of the meetings they have actually gets quite turbulent. There's a lot of arguing. I, I'm reading between the lines. There could be could have been some violence, calls for you know some some more heated activities against the town. 
They have a couple, two or three of these meetings uh, in the Portuguese community. And a week later, miraculously, there is a town-wide citizens community that gets founded by all the civic organizations, the Kiwanis American Legion Board of Trade Rotary Club, also including the Portuguese fraternity, who I think, uh, you know, kind of gets co-opted into this group. Uh, you know, it's a classic example of the more radical group and then the more mainstream group. The more mainstream group is the one that gets to participate in the political process, but it was the actions of the more radical group that allowed the more mainstream group to be able to participate in the political process. So I think that this is kind of what happens here. Um, and to kind of feed into my reading, all the officers of the Citizens Committee were Portuguese, uh, looking at the unemployment issue. Um, in the new organization, there's only one guy out of 22. None of the officers are, and only one guy out of 22 actually gets put in. Um, uh, and that's John DeMello from Davisville. And if we remember John DeMello, he's the guy that ends up running for, uh, supported by the Cape Verde Club as uh, to become part of the school committee. Um, you know, it was kind of an elite effort to take control of the politics, I think, out of the Portuguese hands, uh, even though some of the Portuguese were actively participating in it. And it's important to note that many Portuguese allies were in this group. You know, it was obviously an, a, a progressive group, um, um, not to say that, but, but um, and they were the ones that created the town's response to, uh, to some of the unemployment as a result of, uh, as a result of um, unemployment. Lou, it's all yours. I apologize, this was a long chunk to get into, but um, this will be some really interesting stuff when Lou actually starts talking about some of the people that were involved um, in, the, in these activities. All yours, Lou. We, we, I think we are not hearing him and we, I don't know why we're not hearing him. And now I can't hear you. I muted myself. Luke, well, you, you muted I yourself. I think, I think, you I think Lou may Lou have. A... But Lou, Lou doesn't even isn't even showing up as as having sound. Right. Exactly. That that is the. Uh... You can Lou unmute. Yeah, there he is. Uh, now you got to unmute Lou. Unmute, unmute Lou. I I can't unmute, unmute, unmute him, Lou. but he okay. I think. Lou, try taking your headphones off. I think your headphones are not, uh, are not, are not, you got to go through your screen. You won't hear us, but we'll hear you. Lou, call me on WhatsApp and I'll, uh, and I'll put it through. I'll put it through. Call me on WhatsApp or in FaceTime. Call me on FaceTime, Lou, and talk into your phone and I'll, and I'll do it here. He might have to unplug his hearing, his earphones. Lou, un unplug your hair, your headphones. Unplug. Can you unplug them? Unplug the headphones. Say something. How's this? Yay! Yeah, go for it. That works. Okay, good. Well, I'm gonna. Uh, I'll try to compress this as much as I can. I'll end up by skipping some material. Um, Lou, we can go over into next week. Uh, we'll have you start next week if there's stuff that you want to uh, talk about also, yeah? Okay, good, good, good. Well, in that case, let me... Uh... Okay. Can you see this screen? Yep. Okay, good, good. So this is the third session. Uh, as Miguel said earlier, this is, um, a lot of this is new material. Um, and one of the things I wanna do is to, as we do this, um, people that are listening to these uh, have additional information that are not easily available. And I guess I wanna thank Doreen Diaz for uh, pointing out that Alexander Barrows, another important figure, actually married Maria de Pina in 1861, as well as, whoops. Um, and in 1887, uh, the records show that he marries Anne Merrill. I can't find any, any actual records of that, um, but clearly he, uh, there were children by both, um, by both of those women. They lived together here. Um, I believe that he probably had a family back in Bravo and also one in Falmouth. Um, but 
uh, this again is something that needs uh, more information. Doreen, I want to thank you again um, for correcting that. I much appreciated. Uh, we talked about, uh, you mentioned briefly Anton J. DeMello, um, who was born in uh, San Miguel, immigrated in 1906, um, and was an important figure here. Um, you know, he was a resident, he, he was an early resident, he served in World War II, he owned a grocery uh, business which he sold to uh, Perry. Um, and again, after that, he, he gets real estate and he becomes a full-time truck driver for Robbins Laundry. Um, he also becomes very, very active, and I was not aware of the Falmouth fraternity, um, but uh, he was a trustee and secretary for the Falmouth PA Council uh, and rose to become president for about four years. Um, I mentioned the 1941 funeral only to show again the close ties between the Falmouth community. Anton Augusta um, is one of the first uh, people, I believe he's the first person in Falmouth that I know of. Um, and also, Miguel mentioned a couple of times John DeMello. John is Anton's grandson. Um, he's the one that ran for school committee. I uh, was eventually elected as a selectman. Um, a very important figure. Another very important figure that uh, new to me is John P. Sylvia. Um, I knew of this family, but frankly, um, within my family, he was not regarded as being, quote, real Portuguese, uh, but in fact, he was. He was born in Fayal, um, was one of the very first people in Falmouth, uh, where he worked as a boatman. He later became a harbor pilot, married an Irish woman, uh, Julia Lynch, uh, in Falmouth, had two important sons. Uh, that One is John P. Sylvia, who Mike mentioned, Miguel mentioned earlier about in regard to uh, some of the legislation he was involved with and also um, the efforts in Falmouth. So was Manuel D. Silvia, um, one of the earliest um, Portuguese elected to a uh, town office. Um, John was, John the Elder was uh, frugal, became a, a landowner, heavy taxpayer. He is in St. Joseph's cemetery. His son, um, John P. Sylvia, uh, P stands for Pareta, uh, he becomes a lawyer very early, uh, makes a couple of attempts uh, to run for political office, fails, um, becomes president of the Falmouth Club of Boston. This is an interesting organization uh, of people from Falmouth who work in Boston. Um, and uh, he, as a lawyer, he was obviously, he was active there, um, elected town moderator at a special meeting um, in 1909, is defeated the very next day at the regular meeting um, by uh, Joe Walsh. Um, but he continues on, eventually he gets elected to the school committee. Um, he was one of the key people uh, in opening up Eel Pond. You know, the, uh, this is down in Woods Hole where that drawbridge is. Um, and then that goes back to 1914 when he was very active in pushing that forward. Um, he later becomes, uh, establishes residences in, in Boston, shuttles back and forth between Boston and Falmouth. Uh, during World War I, um, the trains were restricted to conserve fuel um, and he petitioned the state to restore two runs between Falmouth and Boston during the war. Uh, after that, he becomes town council, extremely successful. There's a lot of uh, legal cases he was involved in um, throughout the community uh, with no particular, uh, his clientele were, was, was basically not ethnic at all. Um, he did become the assistant district attorney for the Commonwealth, um, passes away in 1966. He's also, I believe, in in St. Joseph's. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the growth of Falmouth because I want to talk a little bit about the populations. And this is just to point out that um, in the early 
years, meaning from 1860 all the way up to 1960, um, for that 100 years, Falmouth was growing slower than the country as a whole. This is the growth of the United States. It is normalized. Um, so we can, we can compare it, but you can see the slope. And it's, it's uh, and in Falmouth between 1930, even 1940, the growth is very, very slow, which accentuates uh, the percentage of the town that becomes Portuguese as the Portuguese continue to move in. Um, I'm showing this graph again, just to point out this one peak in the Portuguese immigration, it, uh, because during this period is when the, the uh, immigration restriction begins. Um, it goes back to uh, the original efforts to stop immigration, go back um, to the 19th century. The, the first targets were the Chinese. Um, by 1917, they were looking at uh, requiring a literary, literacy test, which would have eliminated uh, many Southern Europeans in particular, but also other foreigners um, from China and from uh, Islamic countries. Um, the War Act in 1921, this was the first real effort to restrict um, immigration. It was based a lot on what happened during World War I, the, you know, the Red Scare, the Bolshevik Revolution and so forth. Um, but the idea was to limit the number of immigrants based on the percentage that were already here according to the 1920 census. Um, and this in fact meant that Northern Europeans were favored because uh, there were more of, the, of them than there were Southern Europeans and others. Professionals, uh, white collar workers mainly were admitted regardless of origin. The net effect though was immigration decreases from 805,000 in 1920, whoops, to 310,000 approximately in 1922. Remember this number 805,000, that's an important number. Um, this continues even after this act gets uh, passed. You know, and they, again, is another example of anarchists. Here's one that is particularly uh, you know, anti-Jewish. Um, all efforts to stem immigration. Um, this refers to the original law, which people are now saying is not adequate, it's not restrictive enough. So in 1924, they do it again, and they make no bones about the fact that they are doing this to preserve the idea of American homogeneity um, uh, up front. And the idea is now, instead of 3% based on 1920, let's go back to 1890. Um, and let's cut it down to 2%. And the whole reason for that, whoops, um, is that it further restricts everybody except the Northern Europeans. Restricts, um, I'm sorry for this uh, sensitivity. Um, Africans, Arabs, Asians. That 805,000 that we talked about becomes 165,000. Um, in 1924, 1925. It doesn't affect Northern Europe very much. They only drop about 20%. But Italy, for example, uh, drops over 90%. So it's again, and of course the Portuguese are in this Southern European class that gets further restricted. Um, one of the most onerous parts of that um, and this effort to stop the immigrants um, was that after that second immigration act, if an American woman marries a foreign man who is not a citizen, not naturalized, she loses her citizenship. It's another form of discrimination because the reverse is not true. Um, if an American man chose to marry an immigrant woman, he kept his citizenship. That was not true for women. Um, as a result of these things, uh, between 1920 and 1930, there are some interesting things. The population of Falmouth goes up um, by almost 37%. Um, this is a breakdown of the kinds, I guess, of Portuguese. The important thing is that 31.5% uh, are Portuguese. 
And by Portuguese in this context, I mean at least one Portuguese parent. It includes those born in Portugal. It includes those in this country, born in this country with two Portuguese parents. And it includes uh, those born um, with one Portuguese parent in this country. Um, and the proportions begin to change a little bit because from 1920 to 1930, the number of, again, this is after the Immigration Acts, uh, the, the residents here born in Portugal decrease. Um, those born in of two Portuguese parents increase a lot and so does 50%. Um, so here we have a population growing by 38%. The born in Portugal increases only a little less than 7% from 454 to 485. Um, the majority of the growth of those at least 50% Portuguese. Um, it's also interesting to take a look at the 100% American population, um, which also grows by 66%. So a lot of changes. Um, between 1930 and 1940, that again, this is current information and I haven't finished analyzing that. And part of the problem is that in 1940, uh, the census only collected statistical samples of parental birthplaces. Back in 1930, that was included. Um, so all we know for sure is that, uh, all, all I know for sure until I finish this analysis, um, is that Falmouth's population increases about 17%. And again, 1940 census includes the beginning of the buildup for World War II and Camp Edwards. Uh, so for sure there are uh, some percentage of that population is from Camp Edwards living in Falmouth, uh, often in Portuguese homes incidentally. Um, the biggest thing is the uh, the born in Portugal population population jumps a lot. That's the single biggest increase, and I you know this probably is related to unemployment in the cities, and uh, and, and people migrating um, here. The uh, we talked about the Portuguese American Civic League, and I Michael. I talked about most of that. Um, you know, the objective clearly was Americanization, um, assimilate with the American society and culture. There's a corollary to this, um, which is that it meant de emphasizing a lot of things that identify people as Portugal. Um, I, my particular bone I'd like to pick with this is that my parents were both fluent in Portuguese. Uh, my father, in fact, was a Portuguese translator for the courts. Um, I was forbidden to read or speak Portuguese at, at home. It was not allowed. Um, I was supposed to be an American. And that all goes back to this Portuguese American Civic League, which it turns out uh, my grandparents were involved with. Uh, my grandfather was one of the directors and my grandmother, Mary White, uh, was president of the Women's Auxiliary um, at one point. So they were very active uh, and it did a lot of good things. Um, but my problem is that now when I want to do research, I can't read Portuguese. Um, so uh, the council organized in 1933, uh, the enterprise names Frank Ferrer. I assume he's part of that same family uh, he was succeeded by uh, Dr. Tavares. Anthony DeMello, who we talked about before, became his president in 1935. Uh, he's defeated in 36, um, but he does come back in 1939. Okay, sorry about this. Um, a lot of their meetings were held at St. Anthony's Club. This is the club um, on Brick Kiln Road. Um, but I noted that the installations, because they were really a big deal and state officials would come down, they usually held those installation of officers at town hall. Um, I did see mention of a, during the war of a, a banquet at the Kuna Mesut Club with 60 members. Um, they were clearly active after the war, but um, then things seemed to die down um, and it was kind of repurposed. Um, in 1946, they were giving scholarship awards. And in fact, there are councils that still exist uh, in many towns today. 
uh, one of the surprises I got is that when I was reading through one of the Dartmouth graduations, uh, that there were, uh, half, I don't know, four or five students that got scholarships from the Dartmouth uh, Portuguese American Civic League. Um, so they do exist still, but they are not nearly as active and they've been uh, significantly repurposed. Um, during World War II, and well, I'm not gonna, this is gonna bring us just up to the war. Um, there were 30,000 GIs at Camp Edwards, mostly from Texas and Oklahoma. Um, and a lot of them, of course, were married. The Red Cross were very active um, in trying to find housing for these married GIs. Um, and one of the examples is uh, the Sambade family. Uh, Joe Sambade was a shoemaker. Um, he uh, had a shop and tea ticket across from uh, close to where the McDonald's is today. Um, and he, that was, that's where his store was. They lived in a house with about 12 rooms um, at that time, including his, his brother lived on one of the floors. Um, the house was about 12 rooms and it was about where the Burger King is today. Um, and they converted 12 rooms. They used all 12 rooms um, for GIs, there was a couple in each room. So there were 24 there. Um, in order to do that, Joe had to build bunk beds in the, the back of his uh, cobbler shop where, his, where he and his children um, slept. Uh, they also talked a lot about some of the impact um, that that had uh, both in terms of, um, well, I'll just mention uh, language. Um, that they were very, very uncomfortable with the Portuguese language because they assumed that uh, people were talking about them. Um, they also, again, were from Texas and Oklahoma and it, exacer it exacerbated a lot of the uh, discrimination um, that existed to a lesser extent in Falmouth. It became much worse beginning in World War II for that reason. Um, and I guess I'm gonna, this is about 20 minutes is probably a good time to break. And yeah, Lou, let's, we'll do, let's do the war next week. Yeah. Uh, Cause okay, there's good. different themes that we'll talk about. Yeah. Good. So um, I, I want to actually just quickly bring up something that you said, which ties in really perfectly with something that we said right in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, which was that, um, uh, um, can, can you unshare your screen Lou? So um, just... something that, something that you said in the beginning that you said, which was um, a lot of these efforts, resulted in you not speaking Portuguese, right? And I think that's the case with many, many Portuguese in yes. town. Yes, yes. And, um, you know, this, this brings me back to the statement, which is that assimilation is not something that's inevitable. It's a political decision. And th there was a politics that went into the fact that you didn't speak Portuguese. It wasn't just that you naturally don't speak Portuguese because something natural happened to you. No, there was a, a political movement that, that resulted in, in these things happening. But it's also really important to point out that in some ways, um, the Americanization movement also uh, did not end the pra a lot of these a lot of these practices. Like these practices, there was a resistance that also took place with many of these practices, many of these cultural practices um, that, on the one hand, were used to kind of uh, help the Portuguese gain a foothold if they were prominent in the arts and culture, uh, but on the other hand, also um, just took place without people really knowing what was going on. I mean, um, if you look at the Enterprise Archive about what was happening um, in the Holy Ghost Feast, for example, there's often mentioned that there was a Whit Sunday celebration or mentioned that something happened, but there's very, very little reporting on what actually happened. Like there's, they just, they, they weren't reporting on what really was happening at these events. And likewise, with most of these events, they were not reporting on what was actually happening. They would say the events happened, but didn't actually go into much detail about it. So. You know, again, um, uh, it has to do with the, with the coverage of the events. True, but um, but but not, but it also because was because a lot of these events were taking place without people really knowing what was you know what was happening. Um, and then you know the other thing is to say that the po the political activities also continued, and we'll talk about this next week just as a little teaser. World, uh, the post World War II moment, um, post World War II, as Lou pointed out, with all of these GIs coming into Falmouth, had a tremendous transformation on Falmouth. Had a huge transformation also on relations among the Portuguese, because a lot of the ideas from outside of Falmouth started to infiltrate into Falmouth, um, you know, especially in light of the second Red Scare that takes place. 
Um, in any case, um, um, and you know, also racial attitudes that were that were also taking place. In any case, um, just want to thank you all again for coming out. Um, I guess this is going to be recorded, so if you want to take a look at the slideshow, if we're going to more detail, uh, you can do that. Um, I also uh, there's one really cool fact that I just wanted to quickly say, which was that um, I, I found out just last night um, in, in looking through some of this stuff and loose thing. I had no idea that Anton de Mello, who is my relative, uh, my father's um, my father's uh, uh, grandfather, um, was was one of the PACL guys. Um, he uh, he uh, that he was involved in any of this stuff. Um, had no idea. So this is very exciting to to be able to. And then also. I, another great joy I have is looking at the chat and just seeing everybody's, just, just all the comments that you all are making about people in your family that you know, or people that, you know, you know Doreen wanted to, to, to correct some of the things um, and, uh, and add more information to it. I hope that everybody does that. And in fact, it's my hope that at the end of our four weeks, last week's our last week, but I have some ideas to keep going if some of you all are interested in, in keeping learning about the stuff that involves uh, recruiting some of you to actually do some of the research. Uh, that uh, that Lou, that Karen, that Doreen has obviously also been doing. Um, if you're all interested, I can I can talk to you all that about about that uh, next week. Um, in any case, um, um, another little tidbit that I love is that my dad was also in Boys Town, which I think a lot of people I'm I'm not sure if any of you know what Boys Town was, but it was this event where um, young men um, from from towns all across America were sent to Washington. In fact, that famous picture of Bill Clinton where he's shaking you know uh, John Kennedy's hand. Um, was was from when he was in Boys Town in Washington. Um, uh, my dad did not get to meet Eisenhower. However, I, what I learned in doing also some of this research is that the group responsible for sending people to Boys Town that paid for all the people to go to Boys Town was in, from Falmouth to go to Washington was the Cape Verdean Citizens Political Club. Um, and then later the Cape Verdean Club uh, were, were the ones that paid for and raised the money to send those kids to Boys Town every year. So when we talk about Portuguese history, Falmouth history. A lot of times we talk about Falmouth history as if that's something that's separate from the history of the Portuguese. No, the history of the Portuguese in Falmouth is the history of Falmouth. So thanks all. I'll see you guys uh, next week. Thank you for your attention. And your Thank time. you so much. And can I just ask you one question? Have either of you yet looked at the Cape Cod early issues of the Cape Cod Times? And was any of this covered, do you know, by the Cape You've all been, you know, you've been talking about the enterprise. I'm just wondering if you've looked at the Cape Cod Times, which is not digitized yet, but we have yeah, microfilm. And, 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 and um, there is an archive, but it's behind a paint wall because it's a Gannett, you know, it's a Gannett uh, publication. So but uh, the, the we'll, we'll talk because um, yeah. we, we can, you know, we've got the microfilm. So, and it's, yeah, but I, it would especially be interesting to see them for uh, information on Harwich Cape Verdeans, which was not really covered in Falmouth. Um, I, I know that the Cape Cod Times did cover more of that stuff on that end of the Cape. So yeah. it would be, uh, I, if you had that digitized, uh, you, you, that would be- one Well, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're working on that. We're, we have to get the rest of the enterprise digitized, then we'll move on to the Cape Cod Times. Um, thank you so much. Really fascinating talk. Thank all of you for attending and looking forward to next week. And we will let you know when the, uh, the this will be up on our YouTube page before long. Thanks so much to everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. See you next week.